Uh, I'd also like to begin by acknowledging and giving thanks with joy to the Kapa'aina o Hawaii, where I live and work, uh, and, the, and, and to acknowledge and give thanks to Kanapo Iwi who cultivate wisdom and right relations to this aina, the land, the water, the all that sustains in this beautiful place on the archipelago of Hawaii. These are relationships that provide a deep and abiding model for me for walking softly and celebrating my own relationships with land and water. And I also want to thank all of you for sharing virtual breath with me today. Um, this is the fundamental meaning of aloha, to exchange our personal moist ecosystems with each other. And I'm imagining our airs to move over watersheds and ocean currents to co-mingle in interesting ways. Um, I'm honored to be invited as part of the Ecologies of Care lecture series organized by Elka, and thank you, Elka, so much for reaching out and doing this work. Um, I'm happy also to see a few key um, people in my network um, joining us today. I'm very honored to have them have them here as well. Um, and I'm hoping to get to learn more about what you all do in discussion. So I'm going to start with a 30 minute talk on this question. What can we learn from community activist art practices as transformational pedagogical approaches to repairing watersheds? That's a mouthful. Um, so I'm just thinking about these three woven terms, art, education, and water, uh, that I hope I can keep in productive tension with each other throughout this, this short talk. So this question uh, is coming from ongoing transformations in my own teaching and opportunities to co-learn with artists for the past decade. So I'd like to share some of that with you today in a few parts. I am, uh, part one is focusing on a project that I did in 2012 here in Hawaii. Uh, that began to shape and shift my conception of how to decolonize my feminist approach to teaching art history. And if you all have questions about that later, I'm happy to, um, to answer them in more depth. Part two uh, focuses on more recent lessons I've learned from classes taught by Chilean-based collective Ansayos and Mary Mattingly. Both integrate their expansive ecological care art practice Practices with teaching. And I've had the honor of learning and teaching with them this summer in the Nomad MFA program, which just this fall has moved and transformed into the Confluence Low Residency MFA program at the University of New Mexico. And there's a new website coming soon. Um, so I'll share that with anyone who's interested um, when it comes available. And that new name, Confluence, uh, partly comes out of the fact that many of the co-learners in this community, including myself, have established water-based creative and learning practices. So part one, uh, I wanna dive into introducing the idea of watershed curriculum with a story about collaborating with the amazing Kanaka installation artist, Kei Lee Chun. In 2012, she conceived of installing these 58 foot tall steel cells, which she had already made and exhibited in a gallery context in the tidal zone at Waimanalo Beach, which is on the windward side of Oahu. And she wanted to do this for a 24 hour period. Waimanalo uh, is a community reserve for Hawaiian homesteads except for the beachfront, which is multi-million dollar property, often owned by global elites as second or third homes. So it's very divided economically and, um, and socially. Waimanalo was once a place of natural abundance for Hawaiians uh, with traditional Hawaiian watershed system that integrated the streams running down the volcanic mountains, the freshwater springs of the island's aquifers into terrace loki farming and fish pond aquaculture. Pre-contact Waimanalo, which means port of potable water, uh, was known for its fresh springs and coastal fishing spots, and one of the earliest settlements of, on the islands. Um, but during the plantation era, that water was diverted, and now it's mostly paved over and channelized in concrete ditches. 
traditional estuaries and fishing spots along the coast have disappeared and it's now more of a tourist fantasy of a white sand beach. So when uh, Kate Ely began thinking of using the cells for an ephemeral site specific performance, she asked me and my land and contemporary art history class to collaborate with her. As a group, we talked about the historical and contemporary dynamics of the site, the interactions with the environment, the time we would spend, and the performance elements. Through our dialogues, Chun decided not to ask permission from the city and county beaches to set up the cells, a strategic act of non-acknowledgement of their jurisdiction over the beach. Instead, she temporarily reclaimed the beach as a Hawaiian space and asked my class, uh, which was an intercultural mix of Hawaiians, local mixed race kids and white kids, um, to help her place and watch over the cells. In essence, personally taking responsibility and engaging and challenging the residents and beachgoers to understand their sense of ownership over the beach and the water differently. As a Malahini, which is a, a recent arrival to Oahu at that point, I didn't have deep knowledge of my Manalo, but I learned through this process of organizing the installation with Pi'ili. Uh, what was important was that no matter what our level of knowledge and connection to Wai Manalo, Chun's project positioned us as temporary caretakers to the place, having a responsibility for being in continuous conversation with the community was a way to engage the seascape and beyond, not as property, but as interrelated elemental forces. In inviting an intercultural mix of participants to help her, Chun first simply asked us to nakilo aina, to immerse ourselves in, in uh, observing as embodied relational placemaking. Over the course of the night, water rushed in and out of the cells and shifted them, even making some of them fall over. And as we became emotionally and physically accountable to these symbolic bodies, our own bodies were on the move, uh, but also purposely oriented towards the tides, which were being pulled by the rising of the first hope for the full moon of the Hawaiian Lunar New Year. Some of the cells were dragged into the water, requiring us to feel the strength of the waves and the sand that wanted to interact with these bodies, even absorb them. And yet we knew it was important to keep them safe and to leave the beach as we had found it. So this ultimately required all of us participating to give renewed attention to those tides in ways that unsettled private property rights and notions of island paradises. Chen was softly and remembering responsibility in particular places. Based on her, her own connection to the landscape, she conceived of the performance also as honoring the fishing Akua, the gods. Without getting into full detail of the kauna here, Ki'ili was obliquely creating a ritual of caretaking associated with the interconnected cycles of the moon, tides, reef, and fish. She often, used this, she often uses this method um, to acknowledge what has been lost in the landscape and also as a way of planting seeds and desires for reviving it within an intercultural community. And uh, as, as we developed this project into other collaborations, I've grown to learn more about this process from Kiili. So in 2020, um, along with the inundation exhibition, I collaborated with her to develop a series of community co-learning workshops for government policy uh, makers, scientists, and citizens around sea level rise in Hawaii. And this was all in preparation for doing an iteration of Eve Mosher's high waterline walk in Honolulu. Um, Eve Mosher's uh, project is an art science community project where she invites anyone to replicate with the toolkits on her website um, uh, a walk in chalk, basically chalking the future uh, potential high water line in urban spaces. And um, so this became the focus of a multi-pronged collaboration with my classes, with other classes, uh, from communication, high school students, elementary school students, and the community. It was a, a huge event. Um, and as I was um, preparing for this event, 
I really was thinking about how doing a project like this in Hawaii demanded a more fully explicit decolonial approach than Mosher's previous iterations, which are um, more focused on art science um, collaboration. So we needed to address the colonial basis of land appropriation and development uh, in, in Hawaii and, um, and how that had led specifically to inundation issues along urban and tourist zones on the island. So I asked Ke'ili to talk to participants about how she uses talk story as a process to acknowledge this history. So um, during the workshop, she talked about Veritas and she also talked about a newer project, um, which is uh, uh, Huliali'i Kala, which was conceived amidst uh, current battles um, about the re-engineering of the Alawai Canal in Waikiki. And um, this re-engineering would essentially protect the tourist zone of Waikiki at the cost of the low income populations on the town side of the canal. And at the bottom left, I don't know if you all can see it, but Ke'ili uses the map of Waikiki and there's a long thin canal that you can see in that map um, as she reimagines Waikiki in the future with these fish kind of coming back in as the, as the sea level rises. And as a complement to this map, the hanging sculpture in the Prince Hotel in Waikiki was composed of 850 copper pieces, each of them representing an o'opu fish belly. And um, each of these meandering, meandering copper fish bellies essentially acted as a symbolic daylighting of the long buried uh, Pi'inayo stream that once fed into the bay at the location where the hotel now stands which could potentially re return with sea level rise. The abstracted curvature of the copper pieces mimic the Oopu's strong underbelly, uh, which is known to move through rocky shallow areas of brackish streams. Um, so strung together, they ultimately represent the necessary connection of the watershed streams and the coastal ecologies now disrupted by the channelization of water and development. And through this project, Chun obligated the hotel to host months long community engagement workshops um, through which Chun began to revive the Mo'olelo or the stories of the stream on which the hotel now stood. She invited every employee of the hotel from the Filipina maids, the, the Hapa registrars, the, Chinese man, uh, the Japanese managers to make a fish. And after each participant pounded out the shape of their O'opu chan, then gave them a card to help them locate their fish within the school where it was hung. The card also had a date that the participant um, made the fish and with it, the Hawaiian moon calendar with information on whether that day was good for fishing or harvesting and which, which fish and plants might be ready. So this small additional gesture in bringing in Hina and the moon and layers of physical and social and spiritual rhythms of water recalls Veritas too. And at the end of the workshop, Chan asked that each employee take to heart this rhythm and with it, the story of the streams when they show visitors their contributions to the sculpture. So she makes this ongoing storytelling machine um, to, to uh, regenerate the watershed through this knowledge. Ke'ili and I continue to work together and we hope to start something new in collaboration with a North Shore Fish Pond restoration project soon. Um, and these collaborations are, are focused not only on accessing or understanding watersheds, but relearning from them, developing modes of apprenticeship, reviving indigenous and place-based models to pass on to others. Working with Ke'ili has shown me about teaching and learning um, and the way that it percolates the same way watery ways as uh, in the same watery ways as watersheds. Learning at the scale of regenerating watersheds is slow, decades long work, perhaps generations long work. And for me, it has required first learning or orienting to Hawaii and the Pacific, which is a slow process. And then learning what confluences, what connecting work needs to be done, where I can contribute, and um, to what flows. And then developing the effluence, the offerings back to community, the richness um, of, of building and rebuilding culture. Over the decade, I am only now starting to feel like I can share this work um, and this process is important. So I'll come back to it in a minute when I get to part two.
but first I just want to conclude part one by acknowledging how Maori scholar Linda Tuhiwai Smith's foundational decolonial methodologies, as well as a cohort of decolonial feminist scholars across Oceania, have helped orient me and my position of privilege and responsibility to this process. <clears throat> Tuhiwai Smith's decolonial research agenda is based on Pacific representations of the ocean tides themselves. She says, the sea is the giver of life. It sets time and conveys movement. And um, it relates the greater ebbs and flows of the ocean to local waters. These tides are related by inward and outward flows of transformation that are best done immersively, collaboratively, locally, in good relation to land and water, and always with permission over time. It's ongoing slow work. And ultimately, I think these types of learning spaces are important for my students in developing fluid mindsets a renewal of emotional, ecological, and political intercultural learning approaches that we need to save our waters and rebuild social and ecological relation. My students now see their coursework as larger and longer than a semester, and their contributions are interconnected to ongoing community conversations. So I wanna to shift to part two now um, and think about how working with Ki'ili this way has led me to other like-minded regenerative care and decolonial art educators. And this community is growing and I'm happy to be connected when in, with in Austria, Austria now. Um, through various meandering paths, I became involved in Confluence led by the inimitable Carol Padberg, who is um, online with us today. And, and Confluence now recently moved to UNM and its focus on art and regenerative cultures is flexible and, immer and immersive format, which offers new understandings about both art and education. And I think it's a great model for the future of art MFA programs. Through Confluence, I've gotten to know the practices of Ensayos and Mary Mattingly more intimately. And we all worked and learned together this summer in Connecticut and Hudson Bay watersheds um, throughout the New York metro area. So I'd like to present Ensayos's and uh, Mattingly's work as other model courses, and that's another play on, uh, on the English word courses, um, in integrated decolonial arts, humanities, science-based education. I'm interested in the ways they use transformative pedagogies to enrich the domain of art. Conversely, I'm also interested in what they as artists offer in terms of embodied approaches to pedagogical philosophy. Their practices act as models for ways not only um, to give communities access to understanding their watersheds, but also sustaining ways to relearn from them. How do they consider the course of a river as holding a wisdom that could map out the course for teaching? With this question, I want to return to what I think are the three main aspects of watershed curriculum, orientation, confluencies, and effluencies. Learning with watersheds first means orienting our bodies, emotions, behaviors in them, as well as understanding how they orient themselves. How do waters originate in mountains when mist, rain, ice, and snow are created? How do they bubble up from aquifers? Where do waters gravitate? Thinking of orientation is about understanding the fundamental intention of water to regenerate itself and everything around it. Its flows are both slow and fast, generational and always shifting according to new topologies that it has itself carved. Building watershed curriculum then first means orienting in a protocol of joy that allows learning to learn in the landscape and with its traditional knowledge holders. Once water starts flowing, it gathers in many ways, and I can't describe them all, but confluencies would be where two streams or rivers come together, where water may collect in estuaries, where it gathers on leaves, needles, mosses, and soaks into the ground, creating pathways uh, to groundwater tables. What all of these have in common is the act of sharing, meeting, relating, and articulating. Translating these lessons into the learning environment means allowing meandering ways of educational opportunities to bring in different communities and fluencies together, to work at articulating across divides, to meet where there is shared interest or concern. 
Finally, this brings us to effluence. Watershed curriculum implicitly critiques dominant extractive learning and creative methods, um, creating methods that might mine the watershed and its communities for information. I think a lot of education is based on this extractive method. Um, and instead, watershed curriculum mimes the watershed, right? It mimics the watershed. It creates a type of decolonial learning that not only attends to the confluencies of water, but also its ways of giving to other water bodies, oceans, atmospheres, planets, uh, plants, humans, participating in the full hydrological cycle. As it does this, water makes an offering for its own regeneration and the life of all else. So too, watershed curriculum seeks to give back to watershed communities, regenerating its soils and waters and cultures and stories and connections. So let me, I think we've seen that in the introduction story with um, Ki'ili. And I now wanna follow this three part course through my experiences with Ensayos this summer. I'll start with Ensayos. <clears throat> And SIOS um, is an art and science collective formed in 2010 with the goal of transforming political ecologies in Tierra del Fuego, Chile. And, um, and this is located at the tip of the South American continent. Camila Morambio, the leader of the group and founding member Christy Gast have taught through Confluence and in many other art spaces to share their co-learning methodologies formulated in relation to the Selknam communities and conservation ecologists in Patagonia. And their current initiatives revolve around saving peat bogs. And Sayos's philosophy of intercultural co-learning in Tierra del Fuego is embodied in their name, essays, efforts, tentative tryings that parallel water's first efforts to flow in a direction that creates life. And Sias One happened in Kirikina Park with a group of 10 artists, scientists, and activists who kept their agenda open to each other with just three short outcomes. There was no um, preconceived idea of what they were gonna create. And over the years, uh, they've developed sculpture, participatory theater, film, and, um, participatory theater, including one about beavers here, which you see in the lower left, um, film, ethnography, network analysis workshops with scientists and communities to facilitate conversation on stewardship. This has led to playful ways of re-engaging sensory understandings of the coasts and bogs of Tierra del Fuego, uh, which Ensayos member Carla Maria Machiavello describes as the meeting of matters, a mushy, soft encounter. Their current project is Turbatol, uh, featured in the Venice Biennale, and it highlights the cultural and climactic value of peat bogs. Patagonian peat bogs face threats, including mining and unsustainable uh, extraction of moss. It's home to 11% of the world's, peats uh, re world's peat reservoirs, which are important carbon sinks for the global climate. So for this installation, Ensayos developed a lab within the, Chile, the um, Chilean pavilion for testing peat reseeding methods that are being developed in Germany, as well as sound and video elements. And there's much more to say about this, and I'm happy to unpack it um, a little bit later. As an important embodied course uh, through the work, um, it focuses on over decades of uh, slow collaboration and co-learning to understand self and modes of listening to the bogs in which they are perceived to breathe, embodied in the words hold, hold, hold. To learn to listen to the bog is also connected to Ensayos's work to support the revival of self culture and language, which is not officially recognized by the Chilean government. So the audio components of the installation celebrate these culturally specific relationships, and I'm just going to play a short clip now that I hope comes through. So you let me know if it doesn't come through.
beautiful breath. <clears throat> so this summer, um, Ansayos asked students to attune, oh, sorry, let me back up here. Um, this is a, a long ongoing project. So Ansayos tries to model their modes of listening to the peat bogs through workshops on other peat lands. Basically the sensory learning methods learned in Patagonia and Sios brings to other learning environments. So in Connecticut, two years ago, um, Confluent students learned the history of the Crystal Peak Conservation Area. Um, and um, through this learning, they then developed ArcGIS story map platforms as an interactive tool. And the students creatively integrated art and science to tell the story of peat bogs as natural filters or the Connecticut, which is a corruption of the peacock term for long tidal river. Basically, they talked back to the history of corporate extraction of the site that is now turned into a quote unquote conservation area. They were very disappointed that the peat bog wasn't actually a peat bog, that there wasn't, <laughs> that there wasn't anything left of the peat bog. Um, and this summer, and Sayos asked students to attune to the sounds of the bog and map the smells of the bog. So we foraged and distilled essences of plants that coexist with bog ecologies like hemlock and skunk cabbage and learned that their smells attract carrion feeding, insects, animals, and other important contributors to the ecosystem. And just a, a short clip, this is um, a, one of the, the confluent oh, students, gosh. Valeria, um, doing some research in the bog. I wish I could get down there. Let's go to the window. Yeah, please have them have oxygen in how long. So part of the reading for this class. Uh, done as we walked together and foraged in pairs and sorted foliage was Robin Wall Kimmer's first book, Gathering Moss. She imparts her own watershed curriculum in trying to reaccess indigenous wisdom about moss across Turtle Island. She talks about the, the peat moss's beautiful structures in which living cells grow upward on top of the dead cells, which then create a vast spongy platform for collecting and filtering water. She says, when we gather together and dance in the elder's footsteps, we honor that link. When we steward the earth for our children, we are living like sphagnum. In some, this decolonialized understanding of peat is to understand it as confluence, as a suite of relationships that hold us and water together. In terms of effluence, um, there are many concrete ways and Sios gives back to its watershed alliances. At the end of class, we were tasked with making sense to uh, related to our own local bogs, bogs to gift to the Turbotol installation, which in turn were gifted to diplomats who gathered in Venice at the launch of the exhibition. And Sayos, along with the Wildlife Conservation Society in Chile, used the installation as an international platform to gather major stakeholders of the world's Piedmonts. Uh, and during the opening weeks, the collective facilitated a forum that resulted in the Venice Agreement, which initiates a new standard for the valuation and practice of protecting and restoring the planet's peatlands. They also used their status as Chilean dignitaries in Venice to highlight the Southern language by using it in the title of their piece and uh, forcing a conversation with the Chilean government, who does not officially recognize the tribe. So I think those are all beautiful contributions to this uh, mapping this course. So the final course I, I'd follow is one, and I'm just going to uh, flow quickly through this in the interest of time, um, is one developed by Mary Mattingly, uh, an eco artist based in New York. Through Confluent, she's been teaching annual iterations of River Labs, uh, a class that invites students to move in and out of her own multiple long-term art education projects, including Swale, a uh, floating public food forest based on Governor's Island in New York, and Public Water, a multi-platform initiative to build community action around water equity, also in New York. As with Ensayos, Mattingly's special talent and slow orientation with communities, policymakers, change agents, 
is to create fluid organizations that decapitalize and reconnect fragmented landscapes. Madding Lee sees pedagogy as key to this process. And this is her 2015 manifesto where she talks about education um, in particular, working towards a nonviolent education which shares underrepresented histories, expands school curriculums and individual classes to include mutual education across nonviolence training towards active compassion. Towards this goal, she lets projects and relationships develop naturally along with her own learning. A good example of this is Swale, which she launched in 2016 as a provocative public artwork and floating edible uh, landscape on a reclaimed barge that moves up and down the Hudson and East Rivers in New York. The piece developed as Mattingly tried to forage in the city to feed herself and learned that growing or picking food in New York's 300,000 acres of public parks was illegal for almost a century, despite the fact that there are food deserts in large portions of the city. So she built a public garden on a barge Large, protected by marine law because it treats rivers and oceans as the commons. And she basically flips the typical meaning of swale as a dip in the land where water collects um, to highlight a place on the water where land collects. Um, basically, in getting shut down by the public park system, Mattingly moved up and down the river, developing relationships with various community river alliances to start garden projects, including the Bronx River Alliance. Um, the barge brought larger questions about food and water commons, as well as a growing number of community partners throughout New York City. So its hub is currently on Governor's Island and it hosts free dirt testing workshops. Um, so residents can test oil for contaminants, um, an ecotopian library and many, many other things. Swale flowed into um, public water. <clears throat> which is a project sponsored by More Art in June 2020. And through this uh, uh, website, Mattingly gathered stories of New York's water supply stretching from geologic time to the present. And it's a living document that motivates communities up and down the watershed to connect their programs and knowledge to each other, including programs like the Whole Farm Planning, um, which um, is keeping contaminants and manure out of the runoff. And in Prospect Park, she made Watershed Core, which is a site-specific dome um, where rainwater is collected and moved through this gravity-fed system of plants found throughout the watershed. The, the sculpture mimics the passage of the rainwater collected in all of the various rivers of the watershed um, and that provides uh, 9 million New Yorkers with water daily. And it's also the starting point of a self-guided tour um, it, throughout the park where visitors are invited uh, on their own meandering path through Mary's prompts. While Mattingly has done the collaborative research for these projects, she's also developed River Labs in which MFA students are invited to create similar co-learning projects with their own communities that push the policy language of restoration and planning um, in different directions. So for the past three years, everyone who's taken the class has developed small web pages and projects related to their own watersheds. And I took this class with Mattingly two years ago um, as a way to further learn about Kanaka restoration elements as part of my art, art history and theory classes in Hawaii. So I'm just dovetailing it back to Hawaii here. This is, these are some of my web pages. Um, and this year, uh, um, River Lab with Mattingly was on Governor's Island where we developed impromptu tools for engaging the East River in person, including scores to move like water, histories of the estuary system and more. Everyone in the class developed something to add to this temporary sculpture, uh, which was then built near Pier 15 in lower Manhattan near the ferry terminals and next to the river. So, yes. Um, and, um, and during this building, um, they all worked together and then helped facilitate the kiosk and um, interact with the public during the installation. In all, Mary's uh, projects through so slow coalition building work towards policy transformation. In 2015, Swale was able to partner with the New York City Parks Commissioner supportive of edible landscapes, strong community groups and stewards such as the Bronx River Alliance. And together they opened New York City's first foodway in Concrete Plant Park. 
its public uh, projects are modeled after swale zone and it's growing strong and swales working on building a permanent barge structure to help propel continuing policy changes and more parks. Um, likewise, public waters programming has given platforms to environmental advocates um, who have passed bills uh, requiring testing for emerging contaminants, including PFAs and chromium-6. And finally, the River Labs projects are filtering through uh, art practices of artists graduating from confluence who've gone on to create watershed curriculums of their own. And this is recent MFA graduate, Stowe Lend, who's been working on Flushing Creek in Queens and is now the New York City Department of Sanitation's artist in residence, taking over the position from preeminent artist, Mary, uh, Meryl Gukilis. Mattingly's generous strategy of creating projects that stream from each other and then together again is different from Ensayos' saturation methodology but both create amazing learning confluences. Projects never seem to end. Authorship is beside the point. Affiliations, responsibilities, and accountabilities grow outward with each new iteration. And all of these contributions will inevitably feed into new learning opportunities for students and community. These projects are arguably part of a larger watershed moment identified by Dorothy Christian and Rita Wong in Downstream, Reimagining Water where they focus on parallel projects in First Nations and allied communities in Canada. In embracing this moment, they simply say, we not only need to learn about water, we need to learn with water. And so for me, that learning with means fully immersing myself into co-learning environments where we learn from each other and from water. We've ha I've had an opportunity to see how these practices create spaces of very complex unfolding dialogue and inquiry that filter purpley watery ways of relating much as watersheds do. Watersheds and the issues of extraction, pollution, fragmentation, bureaucratization are really complex. And this demands learning in the ebbs and flows and with different groups and over time. So the Art of Watershed curriculum looks for opportunities to create deeper long-term, truly integrative uh, stewardship practices that challenge current discreetly carved out solutions for drinking water, sea level rise, and land management. They push the idea of learning with water to understand that water <clears throat> actually teaches us what with means. Water is confluency. It's always seeking itself, always running towards other streams, always soaking into other water beings, generating and regenerating life. Isn't this a great model for co-teaching and co-learning? There's so much more that I have to say about the ebbs and flows of the coursework, but I'll just end provisionally um, by sharing some resources of this type of art educational methodology, and I'm happy to share this further. Um, and I'd love to now have a conversation about any part of this with resonate, that, that resonates with you all. Um, so I, I'm realizing we don't have that much time for questions, um, but I'm also hoping to um, see if any of your own learning as, as part of workshops and art and education resonates with this. I would love to share stories as much as answer questions. So thank you, Ola, to light. Thank you so very much um, for generously sharing and particularly emphasizing learning to learn and, and the ongoingness of learning, but also the slowness of learning. Maybe you can stop your presentation, then we can see each other a little bigger. And um, Ushka and, and Nada um, will facilitate um, the conversation now. Yeah, maybe um, I can start if there is. Hello, everyone. First of all, my name is Nada. I'm zooming in from Cologne. Um, I'm also part of the Ecologies of Care working group and of another project called Fluid Circulations that is actually also dealing with the local water and regional water bodies and how they got affected by post-industrial, um, yeah, let's say post-industrial um, effects or uh, infrastructures and also 
still ongoing um, industrial use and abuse. Um, so thank you so much. That was so much resonating with me uh, personally and um, gave so much inspiration. So, but uh, yeah, I have a qu couple of questions actually um, here concerning um, affiliation with the authorities and also community building, um, but maybe also um, education and um, the interface to the university. Um, so many points where we could start actually um, the dialogue, but maybe if there are any questions in the public, we could also open up first. Hi, Ines. Hello, Nada. And Hi. Hi, everybody. It's, it's so inspiring listening to you after such long day, because here it's evening. Um, but in Portugal, there are some Portuguese researchers uh, in the group as well. And in fact, some of our Portuguese researchers were born in Brazil and they have Brazilian nationality. Um, and one of the research uh, that I've been listening to uh, during these virus this afternoon was around the identi identity politics of Amazonian women. So how women who were born and raised and live in Amazon, um, how can they produce their own subjectivity through their art practices? So there's a very strong theoretical uh, argumentation around their work. And then they're struggling. Uh, I mean, this, this person particularly among the other people is struggling with finding the ways and resources to produce her artwork, which is filmic. So to produce film around this subject. So it was very inspiring, inspiring listening to her today uh, speaking about Amazon, uh, Amazon uh, region, not only the river, but the region and gathering resources so to produce artworks. And at the same time, listening to your curriculum and methods and approaches, um, dealing with one of her subjects while not struggling so much with resources, because uh, you, you, I mean, you were presenting us practices which are lucky to be funded by big international events. And mm -hmm. so this is one of the remarks I want to make because uh, it, it's interesting that in the end of the day, um, the globe uh, is looking at these subjects from very different economic uh, conditions. And as Nada was pointing out, uh, her work is around um, the transformation of landscape through industrialization as mine. That's one of the things we have in common. And I wanted to, to bring as well to the table, it's not exactly a question, but it's sharing other struggles. One is, of course, the pipeline model. We are struggling with a pipeline model of knowledge production uh, where teams must pipe one another so to come out with, with outputs, with results. And it's so inspiring and interesting that the projects you've presented, uh, they are processual and so they lead to results which are unexpected from the beginning, maybe because they assume they are artistic from the beginning. So one of the questions I would like to pose you a bit later is how to uh, objectify, I mean, not in a commodification manner, but to actually produce objects that eventually could travel or be replicated. So how can these knowledge production processes, which are highly contextual and contingent and depending on people, can, be, can travel and be presented in other places? Um, it also resonates with the Netflix series I was watching this week, in fact. It's about the water floods in Poland in 1997. I don't know if you saw it. It's about the dramas of Soviet knowledge production and this young woman from uh, Wrocław who went to the Netherlands to study dams and uh, the conduction of water. So she's an expert in modern waters. Uh, struggling with Soviet knowledge on territorial transformation in much wider sense. So it was so interesting, fighting with pipelines, watching Netflix and listening about uh, subjective and uh, inscription of people from rivers in the hinterlands. Um, this resonates somehow. It seems that these water studies, they, they flood one another. 
um, but some of them are really man-made. And among this group, there's architects and engineers as well. And we are responsible for the transformation of landscapes. So that would be another question. Um, how are experts engaging the discussions that you are raising? So one thing is how to travel. And the other would be, how do they see it and perceive it? Uh, what's the kind of repercussions or reactions that you may have? And as it sounds like you are doing some amazing watershed curriculum building of your own. <laughs> thank you, thank you. That was um, that was really beautiful sharing. And I think there's a number of questions wrapped up in there, and it, it ties back to I think what um, uh, the the first I I don't see not Nada again, but Nada was asking about. <clears throat> um, resistance um, from authorities and how you kind of build this coalition across different kinds of communities. And um, one of the things that I've been talking to other folks that do this kind of slow learning practice outside of the semester model or the hour and a half long model of teaching, or, you know, you're here all at, at 9 p.m. listening to me um, outside of these <clears throat> these these regulation models of when learning should happen um, is that um, all, all of us uh, have come to an understanding of how we, especially in pos positions of privilege as professors uh, in universities that have a lot of money, how we can leverage that wealth um, and how we can leverage our ability and our capacity that we have uh, to create spaces within community and opportunity for our student, students to give back to community. Um, so that's a, a really important priority for me uh, is to try and develop um, some kind of flipped power modes where um, the university, the, the resources that I have in the university are really um, honoring ways to give back to the community. And it, it, it's particularly important because I am in a land grant institution in the United States, which means that it's state sponsored land that was appropriated by the taking of that land from Native Hawaiians. Um, and so giving back to the community and, and kind of keeping the university accountable and the government accountable uh, to those communities is really important. Um, so I, I try to gear the ethics of my class and the, the, the effluences of my classes back that way. But, but through art, as you say, through art, art, art is such a beautiful opportunity, pedagogical model, um, because there's a lot of soft spaces outside of policy and, um, and kind of like hard, hard science spaces that open up for people to tell stories in different kinds of ways and share knowledge in different kinds of ways. And so it creates ways to bring people together in those confluences that, are, that don't seem so dramatic, where they can kind of slowly build um, uh, connections to each other. Uh, and um, and there's, the, I, I think the models by Ansayos, the way that they use um, performance and play acting the way that Mary uses gardening and um, and and walking and all, all different kinds of um, uh, spaces are these soft spaces that can um, develop uh, for learning and water to flow more slowly right that's what that's what that's what we want with <clears throat> with watersheds is not that pipeline model or the or the channelized model where water is flowing really fast or learning is flowing really fast we want to we want to let it soak into spaces and um, and to let those spaces kind of the, the ecology of those spaces to grow and then feed other spaces um, so and I, I'm, I'm just quickly saying that I, I'm um, I, I'm very aware of how I'm leveraging my um, my classrooms to kind of uh, create accountability for um, uh, for those in authority <laughs> and also opportunity for, for community and students. So maybe that leads to other questions that people might have.
Thanks, Sophie. So glad you could join. Yeah, if nobody else uh, want to ask a question, I may um, come in again with my question. My, sorry, my internet just broke down, so I have to get back in. Um, so yeah, maybe I, I would be interested to know when you're working on um, collaborative projects that also include not only students and artists and um, maybe locals, neighbors um, that live around those water bodies, but also um, other scientists, um, hydrologists maybe, and politicians, how you build a relationship particularly to authorities. Because as I, at least um, in our case, um, it's a really complex situation with so many like agents involved that, uh, and if you want to change something, then there is the there are so many different layers of negotiation um, with locals, with the um, industry that settles that it want to use the the water, with the yeah, as I said, like different uh, political economical um, interests there. And my question is how you start to navigate all of those difficult relationships um, to come to a moment where you really can change something um, in the direction of, as you said, uh, regeneration, for example, or rewilding. And for example, in our case, what we also learned is that th there's also a lot of money involved. If you want to renaturalize or uh, regener regenerate just a small piece of a river that was channeled and um, like uh, put into pipe and then, um, yeah, um, like not flowing, like a nat natural pass, um, then this would cost so much money that you really have to fight maybe with the, also on the legal level that like to make people accountable, like companies accountable that first um, kind of, um, yeah, um, stole the, let's say, um, stole the natural pathway of the water and um, yeah, That's used really it otherwise. Question. So yeah, how did you, what did you experience? So not, I, I, I wish we had more time for, for a longer conversation because Nada, that's such a, an important question and there's so many different layers to that question. Um, and I, I think, um, first of all, I would say that I don't start any project and I think these artists that I introduced as well wouldn't, wouldn't start with a project knowing or or trying to conceive of an outcome, a concrete outcome. Um, they're really trying to resist the solutions framework of policymakers or administrators where there has to be a, a kind of quick timeline for, um, uh, for, for change. And, and I think this is where the ethics of care and, and pedagogies of care come in. Um, in doing care work and uh, kind of shifting, you know, what I'm, what I'm calling a watershed moment here, shifting our thinking about change into this, into how change works and how change, and how change needs to be processed in our own bodies and emotionally in smaller communities um, so that there is a desire to see that change from multiple stakeholders. Uh, that, that is the work I almost feel like that's the work that needs to be done first before the, 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 the policy change happens. And, um, and I, I think the examples, um, the, the projects that Ensayos and, and Mattingly uh, work on um, work that way, right? They're, they're building small desires and small communities, uh, larger and, and, and um, across fragmented communities and tying them together. And sometimes the, the policy changes that happen are, um, are adjacent to the projects and come years later <laughs> or, or, or months later and from other, other folks that, are, you know, uh, that, that were involved in the project in the, in the first place but are working um, in a nonlinear way. And so to recognize the kind of nonlinear transformation, I think is important in, um, 
in this kind of care pedagogy and care ethic and um, in creating spaces. So it, it's really, I've had to learn to let go sometimes of the, of the solution framework, but also to propose for the, the policymakers or the scientists that I might be collaborating with, propose smaller iterative solutions that they might see, you know, with their, with their um, quantitative lens <laughs> um, that they might see as outcomes. And a lot of science, I, I'm now collaborating with uh, uh, Hawaii Sea Grant, which is part of the university and <clears throat> has money for regenerating watersheds and coastal systems. Um, and they have a diversity, of, a diversity and community officer. And so she's helping me kind of do that art science community translation to the policymaker in the science um, field. So there are lots of folks to work with who can help you with that, um, that kind of translation so that, um, so that they can leverage grants, right? So that they can, they can write the grants that have qualitative as well as quantitative outcomes articulated for the, for the folks that need to see those terms. Meanwhile, we're, we're working in much subtler ways <laughs> with, um, with feminist care practices that don't get recognized in that process of transformation. And, and part of writing, uh, part of what I'm thinking about in writing this book is, is really trying to develop a model of, of art history and um, writing about art that acknowledges all of that care work um, that, that's actually part of the, the pieces, but we don't often acknowledge it. Right, we acknowledge the, the kind of concrete manifestation. Yeah, thank you so much. Again, this is so much resonating um, with me in this moment and also in this particular case, because just to explain this water body or the stream that I'm talking about, I mean, we're in a moment here where our government decided to withdraw uh, and to stop um, lineage open pit coal mining. So in this moment, it's really it's really like about to, to see what, how these water bodies are actually affected and what has to be done and by whom, because actually industry companies are drawing back pretty fast and they try to get out of every responsibility. So right now there's like the need or uh, yeah, like politicians that feel the responsibility of communities feel like this need to, to rush, to, to gather information, to go to the archives, to gather, let's say voices to make them accountable so that they're not starting like just drawing back from everything and try to get their hands clean again because yeah as I said everything that has to deal with yeah that deals with water in the region is kind of affected by those I don't know like two huge mainly two huge companies so yeah this is why there is a lot of like need to 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 look for solutions and uh, like alliances that that work on the political level quickly but then it made so much sense to me what you said about um, creating desires through in our bodies and that this demands this work of care that then is often forgotten but that it works so much through our actually also bodily connections to yeah to those environments and um, yeah i just wanted to share this that i for myself and maybe I'm also because our group is partly here. Um, so yeah, I think we as a group also experienced that pretty much that there was like, a, that we felt kind of connectedness to each other, but also to the water, through the water actually, community created through the water, yeah. I think we have a question in the, in the chat. I will just read it. Could you describe examples of how a pedagogy of care can be reinforced in higher education and perhaps challenges of doing this? And I think looking at the time, this will, I think, be the, the last question we, we can take up. It's, it's a huge question, like the other questions were huge. huge. Question. Um, and and um, just we would need hours, but I think- Are you all frozen? Okay, are you frozen? Um, am I, can folks hear me? Okay. Um, this is a question from Carol and, and Carol, I, I know we're, we're short on time, but do you want to, do you want to add anything to the question? 
before I start, you know, she might not be in a space where she can share. So um, thanks so much, Carol, for this question. And Carol is is um, the, the founder of Nomad Now Confluence. So I am honored that she's asking me this question, question because she has so many examples of her own, I think, of um, describing how pedagogy of care can be reinforced in higher education. She's, she's um, a living model of this. Um, one example that I might share really quickly is um, is, is not related to the watershed curriculum per se, but is um, connected to uh, thinking about the department that I, that I teach in. Um, we have recently over the past few years um, undergone some self-reflection about, um, about our lack of efforts to, in decolonizing the curriculum for our, our local students and really making this a place of Hawaiian learning. Um, it had like like many uh, higher education institutions. While on the surface, there's a, a kind of lip service to um, uh, inclusion. Um, the 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 curriculum doesn't necessarily embody that transformation, and um, that's the case in our art department as well, where we still teach a very Bauhaus model of art education with the media all siloed out and there isn't really a space for um, kind of thinking about um, including Hawaiian art practices and the and the integrative modes of Hawaiian art practices that um, think about ecology and social and 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 social connection and um, formal and material qualities together and so um, I designed a class last uh, last year around um, having a conversation around this because um, I wanted to create a space for students to be able to ask graduates um, and, and artists uh, who are now working in the community their own thoughts about how we can transform that and what they, what they saw um, as, as potentially important in that transformation. Um, and so the class just really was a, it was an oral history class. It was a talk story class where the students were, were tasked with forming the questions that they thought were important. Um, and, and, um, and we all did co-learning together around how to be responsible uh, for our own positionality and asking questions to the artists. And then also um, giving back to the artists, doing work with the artists so that they felt like there was a, a connection and a contribution from the students to their own work too. So it was, a, it was a beautiful class where we didn't come necessarily with to, to a, a proposal for change in the department, but we um, did make three or four um, kind of concluding statements about what the students thought would be important. And one of them, of course, was to learn more in community. Um, they really enjoyed <clears throat> working with the artists and being outside the frame of the typical classroom and really learning, um, learning how to ask questions uh, and um, engage in dialogue. And for them, that was a really hard thing to do was to learn to listen and, um, and, and kind of uh, engage uh, in someone else. They had never had conversations like that before. So that in and of itself was uh, a huge learning experience for them. So this is part of a slower iterative process where I'm kind of developing some, um, some th three key things that we might um, think about changing within the department from that class. So that's, that's just one example, Carol. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so thank you all so much for, for joining and um, I'd be, very happy to, I, I know Elka recorded this, so I, I hope my, um, my resources page can be accessed via the recording, but I'm also happy to, um, to network with anyone via email. So thank you so much for, for coming and sharing space with me. Well, thank you so much for sharing and for making the sharing possible. We'll of course share the recording with you <laughs> and, and um, and I think we opened some some huge questions around time, um, resources, um, 
slowness, but also how one has to find solutions fast. So I think living with complexities and contradictions um, and also how this can become part of um, working in higher education and of course in the context where we are working secondary education with schools. So I think there's a lot of learning um, to, to take with us, not to take away. I don't think it's a takeaway. It's something to take with us and to, to, to keep uh, working with and to learn how to learn. I think that's what you said very beautifully at the beginning. So I, I hope that it allows for all of us here to learn how to learn otherwise and differently and, and more. And I really want Absolutely. to say thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all.